All right, thank you for the reminder. And I'll start over. I am uh, Dr. Simmons. I'm faculty here in mechanical and aerospace engineering, and I am super excited uh, to introduce some members of our external advisory board who uh, are also helping us build this new program. We, we rise, women engineers rise, uh, to build our mentoring network uh, in support of the students of mechanical and aerospace engineering. Uh, so today, uh, we are joined by, in no particular order, uh, Louise Scott, who is recently retired uh, from the Southern Company. Uh, she graduated uh, from UF with her bachelor's degree in mechanical engineering uh, and uh, worked for Florida Power uh, and then moved to Southern Company and has been there for uh, more than 30 years and I guess retired, I don't know what the exact count is, uh, but uh, retired as vice president and uh, had all kinds of huge responsibilities. And I'm sure we'll hear a lot about the people she encountered in that role um, today as we uh, ask her to uh, tell us a little more about her mentoring uh, and managing experience there. Uh, we also have with us uh, Carol Weber, who recently uh, moved to Orbit Fab. Um, and I've heard her describe that as gas stations in space. Uh, before that, she was at the Gates Corporation uh, and also uh, has degrees from the University of Florida, of course, go Gators. Uh, last but definitely not least, we have Bill Gaddle, who recently retired from L3 Harris um, as president of Space Systems and uh, has uh, been part of UF's Dean Advisory Board uh, and of course the department's advisory board as they all are. And so we're very happy uh, to have these folks with us today. Um, as promised, uh, this session is gonna be about cultivating a growth mindset. And growth mindset is a term that was coined and heavily researched by Carol Dweck. She's a social scientist uh, faculty at Stanford. And she identified this concept that if you approach a task or a learning experience or even just move through life with the idea that your skills are fixed, then you'll, encounter, you'll inevitably fail because we all do. Uh, and, and those failures, you'll not, you will not be able to learn from those failures and you'll have a harder time overcoming those failures if you operate under a fixed mindset. Uh, in contrast, if you operate under a growth mindset that everything's hard, <laughs> everything's learned, everything is an experience to grow and get better and improved, that and improve rather, that your outcomes will inevitably be better and stronger. And she's done this research over and over with different cohorts, children, adults, college students, uh, and seen over and over that those who approach tasks with a growth mindset to uh, learn from mistakes and build on their experience uh, do better, are happier, have better outcomes than those who approach tasks with a fixed outcome. And so the simplest example that I like is sort of the, the little kid elementary school example. When kids get back a, a, a bad grade, you know, someone with a fixed mindset would say, well, I'm just not smart enough to get a good grade. And somebody with a growth mindset would say, wow, I guess I need to try harder next time. Uh, and, you know, I think we would all do well to sort of channel that little kid spirit and approach everything uh, in life as much as, we, as much as we can with that growth mindset. Um, and so today I want to, uh, we will start by uh, having um, our panelists go through um, and briefly introduce themselves, kind of share their own engineering career story, uh, and hopefully share with us one or two anecdotes um, that are particularly, uh, I don't want to say convincing, that's not quite the right word, but sort of tell us a story or give us a good example of how important growth mindset is or and, and was in their journey. Uh, so do we have any um, volunteers to start or, or shall I pick? All right, I'll pick. <laughs> Carol, you're you're in my you're you're in, you're in the hot spot in the, on the screen. So why don't you go ahead? Super. I yeah, grab her. I'm used to going last, so it's nice okay. to go. All right, good. Well, happy to help. Um, again, I'm so glad you all could attend today. I, I know you're juggling classes, some of you are juggling work, and um, nothing's ever easy in a pandemic. So I appreciate your time today. Um, so. Uh, 
Um, as as, as uh, Dr. Simmons introduced, I am a Florida grad. I got my bachelor's in mechanical there at the University of Florida. And I added a master's in mechanical from a different university in Florida, a sub, sub not as great university, we won't even talk about them. And then uh, moving out here to Colorado, added a PhD in a math-based piece. Um, that's really been an exciting journey for me. Most of my professional career was in the space and aerospace business, in particular in um, propulsion systems, rocket propulsion systems and their fluids which is incredibly unique. So I wanna carry that through to the example that, that I'll share about growth mindset. Um, I have also done some commercial work um, in consumer products, which is quite a contrast from the one-offs and the uniqueness of anything in a rocket to something that's made millions and millions a day. So when you graduate from the University of Florida, you've earned your seat at the table. And I don't use that term lightly. Um, the rigor for mechanical and aerospace curriculum there at the university is purposeful and it will prepare you for a lot of things. Um, you have you know, specific aerospace courses that, that may deal with you know, where you wanna go for your first career or it may not. For me, it did not. And I wasn't really prepared for things like hypergolic rocket propellants and cryogenic fluids. And they're intimidating. And I want to share that that growth mindset opens you up to something you could never imagine as being exciting. And after all, they have fancy names and they're harsh chemicals, but they are fluids. So they do you know, behave in accordance with the laws of physics. So when you go back to those first principles, you can draw on them in a growth mindset for anything that you'll face in your career because the world is changing quickly. And although Florida has prepared you for some things, you will, you know, obviously, and I know you know it, you'll tackle, the, you'll tackle things you never expected to. One other piece I wanna share is I see, um, uh, young graduates, often they start their career ready to tackle everything. And perhaps they've, they've entered a company that they, they feel like is a good fit, that has good values, that matches their own, that's going to, to challenge them. But I see new grads get discouraged quickly because it's not everything they want it to be. Often companies, especially large corporations, hire you as an asset because of your talents, because of you know, what you, how you interviewed your university, those kinds of things. But they're hiring you for their business needs. They need to get to know you. So take that opportunity, whether you're placed in the exact group or team that you want to learn everything you can about the team that you're in and take it to the next assignment in that company or perhaps a company you move to. Thank you. All right, thank you. You caught me enjoying my cookie. Um, <laughs> None of us get snacked yet, come on. Yeah. All right, Bill, do you, would you like to go next? Sure, I will go next. So uh, I graduated, I like to say that I got off the Mayflower and went to the University of Florida and then graduated in 1984, 1987. So I've been around a long time and doing this a long time. Um, you're showing leadership just by being on this call. Those of you, I know there's not a, a lot of you today, but just by taking the opportunity to learn from people is showing leadership today. So I, I commend you on that because quite honestly, that's the first step in a lot of this. It's just being a learner and being teachable. So I, I started as a new grad at Harris Corporation in Melbourne, Florida. If you don't know where Melbourne, Florida is, it's just north or just south of Cocoa Beach, where Ron John Surf Shop is, those kind of things. And I did thermal analysis on spacecraft. So Carol was in the space industry. I was in the space industry. Right after I joined the company, the shuttle exploded. And so that set the company in a different mindset. But the company knew, as Carol just mentioned, you're an asset to that company. That company wants to grow you. They want to make sure that the investment they've made in you is worthwhile. So it didn't turn out exactly as I wanted. I had to do a lot of odd jobs for a period of time because, quite honestly, the shuttle program impact a lot of the space community. And it's also, I think Carol mentioned as well, it's, there's a value set of what you wanna be. I went into aerospace and defense. Uh, Harris Corporation is a very technical company. 
Um, it has security clearances. So the government gets to watch you all the time about your security. There's certain places you can't travel. You need to match what you do and what you want to do with the company that you're going into. Um, and there's a lot of ways to do that. And certainly communicating with some of us would be that. But there's a lot of engineering fields you can go into and, and you have to mix and match. The good thing about Paris Corporation was is we did a lot of things like the weather satellites that you see weather every evening with the GOES satellites, which Carol's moving to. Uh, anything you see on Google Earth that takes pictures of your houses, we made those telescopes. Every GPS satellite we've been on. So all these things, the, the reason why I bring that up is not so you can get really excited about Harris Corporation, but it's more of, we did things that matter. And whatever you do in your career, you're gonna have to figure out ways that it, you're passionate about it, that it matters to you. What you're doing matters. Because if it's just a job we, we call coin operated and all, you, all you're doing is coming for a 40 hour paycheck, you just won't be that happy in your career. So as long as you're passionate about it, it's good. The other thing I would tell you is when I started, I was a flaming introvert. I would actually physically get ill before I'd give presentations. A presentation like this would take me hours and hours to prepare for, and I would probably throw up before I did it. And I got to the place in my career where I could actually brief hundreds and even thousands of people. So how do you do that? Well, if you're an introvert on this call, all is not lost. And just because you aren't bold today doesn't mean you can't grow. And other than praying a lot, I actually had to ask the extroverts to slow down. And the way you get a meeting to slow down is ask questions. And so I had to do that early in my career. And I sought places where I could make a difference where I couldn't make the problem any worse. So the company would struggle in an area and I'd go, I'll volunteer for that because I figured I couldn't make it any worse than it already is. So it, I, I took away the risk factor as I was this flaming introvert. Um, our company went through a lot of changes. We went through, we bought, we bought a company called Excellus. You might know it as the old Kodak. Um, we merged with L3. We became a 47,000 person company. All those things create uncertainty in your life and in your career. But every one of those uncertainties or challenges is an opportunity for you. And every one of them is a mindset, a growth mindset where you go, I'm not going to waste my time trying to fix things I can't fix. I'm going to position myself the best I can. And so I looked for any place that looked like it needed to be fixed. And so I became Mr. Fix-It. Um, what I started to realize is my strengths were I could see the big picture I could, and I could communicate the big picture. I couldn't create the big picture. I was not that innovative, but I could draw upon people who were innovative and paint a picture for the company. And so that's where I started to move up in the company. And I believed in people and I started to be very self-aware that there were certain things I couldn't do. And I just wasn't any good at. And so I partnered with people that were opposite, opposite with me. People that had completely different skills. That chafes at times, but it made us all better. The other thing I figured out about myself is I could take risk. I figured out how to do risks. And so I was able to transform the, our business from a component suppliers that built antennas, huge antennas that go on orbit, um, to full satellite systems. And it, again, it took self-awareness. I had to actually figure out what limitations were real in my head and which aren't. This is a big part of a growth mindset. I used to create with my team, what we used to call we believe statements or I believe statements, which were, what do I believe about the market? What do I believe about us? What do I believe about me? And then I'd look at them and say, are those things that are real or are those things that are imagined? Or can I break through those? And so that's self-awareness is a huge deal for me of how to do it. I took on massive challenges, things that were on fire in our company that just weren't working very well. That allowed me to, grow, to basically have confidence to grow. But just keep in mind as you go forward, it's, it's a lot of you being teachable, you being accountable, and you being taking feedback to make yourself better every year. So I went a little long, but I'll pass it off to Luis now. And no, thank you. That was great. Luis? Yeah, I could, I could listen, Carol and Bill, to you two all day. Um, so many things I take away and agree with the things and the, the points that you made. But um, I am Louise Scott, and I am, as of April 1 of this year, going to be a retired utility executive. I've, I've worked my entire career since graduating the University of Florida in 1986 in the utility industry. And, you know, it was really interesting because I, I was 
you know, alongside folks like Carol and Bill going to these exciting creative industries, defense, space, rockets, and oh, ho, hum, I went and worked for a utility. But lo and behold, if you think about the news today, I, I bet you don't hear a newscast that does not bring up energy and what to do in this world, be it what's going on in Europe to push for renewables in our clean environment and, and, and worries about our climate. It is an incredibly exciting field. And talk about a growth mindset. You know, it, it's how do we deal with our future for our energy needs and try to eliminate carbon and issues with our climate at the same time. So it has turned out for me to been just incredibly exciting. And what an opportunity for growth for anyone. I'll add that as I entered the industry in the mid um, to late 80s, it was a shift towards digitization and automation and automation of controls in the utility world. And that's where I was able to step in uh, it's my career started in what we call the distribution world, which are all the poles and wires and, and substations that you see when you drive around. And earlier in the 80s, we didn't have a lot of insight as to what that equipment was seeing, feeling, doing, or actual controls to be able to open, close switches. When I stepped in, that was the world I stepped into and was able to participate in that. And Bill mentioned it too, my ability for growth, because believe it or not, you all, I actually have more of an introverted personality than an extroverted personality. And I wasn't one to jump up, raise my hand and say, oh, let me participate and do it. Folks saw in me an ability that I didn't necessarily recognize or do. Um, so I was able to participate in that. I have a couple of takeaways that I thought about as I thought about this session today to be able to share to help with the growth. Bill mentioned one that I truly, truly believe in. That's the foundation and it's self-awareness. There are so many tools out there. I bet you this whole audience has taken a Myers-Briggs, a DISC profile, some sort of personality profile to help you learn about yourselves. Those things are valid and they're real and they're worth thinking about. So if you have one, go dust it off, reread it. If you don't believe what it says, ask someone else, and I bet you they'll confirm that those things are in fact true about you. And, and internalize what you read and what you see because you've got to know yourself in order to be successful in growth or successful in relationships, whatever it is. Um, so do take those opportunities um, to have that self-awareness because it'll point your growth in the best directions for you. Your ability to listen. You know, the good Lord gave us two ears, one mouth for a good reason, so that we had double the ability to listen versus always be the one talking. Um, you know, stuff you learn in kindergarten, it's always really good. And work as a team. Um, Carol and Bill both shared all the work that they do as parts of teams. And I, I it's so exciting and refreshing to meet with so many of the students today. I think you guys get this one really well. You get teamwork. It's so important when you eventually work in, in industry or, or wherever else, higher education, wherever you land. Teamwork is key. And be the person that helps build the team because it'll build yourself, by the way, as you do that. You know, I always tell my groups, I always tell myself, just, just, cheer that parade as it passes you by at times. As someone else is achieving, be their biggest cheerleader. And it'll come for you too. And you're seen then, and you are, you know, you are the person that is a great team player. Um, you know, you first build the team and let the team build the business. I, I believe in that wholeheartedly. You gotta be able to admit your mistakes. You gotta be able to be humble. You have to realize that, yep, Mistakes are made and it doesn't define you. It doesn't define your whole future. And I'll say that because with all those other things, knowing yourself, being a part of the team, it won't define you. Now, if you 
well, I'll just say behave badly on a mistake, you don't admit it right from the get go, you may have some problems that you're going to have to recover from and your recovery could be longer and may result in some negative things. So think about mistakes and admit it, move on and, and just correct things as you need to. And finally, I always suggest always become a student of the business. As you land in industry or wherever you may land or where you are right now, get the big picture. Understand the holistic view of the business you're in or the enterprise that you're in. You will be better in the job that you're in and you'll see the world maybe at times a little differently. Um, Sometimes finance makes engineering decisions for you, right? Um, so you've got to understand, well, is it the big evil finance thing happening here or is there good rationale as to why decisions are made? So I think those pieces always will help you with your growth journey going forward. So I'll, I'll stop there too, but thank you for this minute um, yeah, to talk a little bit about myself. Um, no, that was that was um, a great story. And I, I yes, I was thinking about uh, the panel today and thinking about how how very much you were you, utilities were in the news <laughs> these days. And and uh, yeah, I think, uh, you know, in, investing in, in core strengths uh, is always a good place to start. And, and we certainly rely heavily on utilities. So um, so I think it, it's interesting to hear you know, how, how that's evolved throughout your career. Um, I heard uh, all three of you actually articulate a couple things. I well, so I'll say um, those of you on the call, um, feel free to raise your hand or message or even unmute and ask questions. Um, I was gonna open with a bit of a summary of what I was hearing and, and a follow-up prompt. Um, I did hear some specific strategies from the panelists on um, ways that, that they themselves um, or, or have seen other people try to cultivate this growth mindset and make sure that they're um, learning as much as possible from their different experiences. I heard uh, Bill mention uh, to ask a lot of questions that also served him really well to kind of slow down the people who were talking too quickly or um, you know trying to keep moving the meeting forward when he was kind of playing catch up and trying to learn and trying to grow. So I think asking questions was one very concrete thing. Uh, and then we also heard this theme of, of knowing yourself um, and asking others for input on sort of what's real and what's imagined, making sure you're assessing your own strengths and weaknesses and being very fair and honest about where to grow and how to grow. Um, are there other specific suggestions you might have for um, some of these folks, either that I didn't summarize very well <laughs> that you already mentioned, or maybe new things you'd like to add uh, for, for our uh, students? I love this point that Louise just made about mistakes, about um, we're all human, we're all flawed, you're gonna make mistakes. And it's how you handle it that's more important. There isn't a single person that's going to make you or break you in a job or in academia, except for yourself. So by admitting that mistakes, and I see this more in, in young grads now, this ability to kind of collaborate, collaborate and say, oh, man, I messed that up. But it might be harder in the workplace because there's so much at stake. But but again, Louise, I think that was fabulous advice about how you admit it and work through it. And isn't that the definition of growth right there? Yeah. It's also, again, I would add on to that. It's, it's the definition of ownership. Um, you know, one of the things that happens in your career is you, you will make a mistake. I mean, I, I was going to use this example later, but I'll tell you now. Our company called in a C-130 to pick up a shipment from by the Air Force. It landed at Patrick Air Force Base. Unfortunately, the person who scheduled it in our company did not tell anybody that we should be out there and have our, our shipment ready. So what I got as a leader was a call from a colonel, or I think he was actually a general, and, said, and was telling me I was a complete idiot because I had spent money, I think it was $300,000 to get a C-130 to land on the tarmac and no one was there. This is no different than you trying, when you go to an apartment store and try to return something. The, quite, what the person wanted was accountability and ownership. And what they wanted, what the whole thing was my response. And the whole thing for you, when you make a mistake like that, 
is our response. If you're honest with your response and say, I said, look, I don't even know how this happened, but I own it. You can call me. I am the person in charge. I will take responsibility for it. This is my problem. This is my company's problem. And we will fix it. And within 24 hours, I will have a response to it. It's turning the feedback of when you've made a mistake, one, taking ownership and accountability, and then taking an action to say, I'm going to get better and commit to it. And that's what companies want. That's all we want. We don't, I mean, it's certainly if you're making the same mistake over and over again, we got a different problem. But for the most part, we're all going to mess up someday. And we've, we've lifted satellites that were still bolted down to the floor and damaged. And we've done all kinds of crazy things. We ran a satellite into a wall and our production facility. All this stuff happens. It's all about, as Carol said, what is the reaction? What are you going to do about it? How are you going to maintain the accountability and the ownership and not make excuses? And quite honestly, it's no different when you want to return a shirt to a department store and you go and you, you hand it to them. All you want is somebody to take care of it. <laughs> you don't want your excuses. You want your, you just want them to take care of it. And that's all you, they want in the industry. And you're going to have moments like that. It, it's just going to happen. Um, it, it just it just does. So hopefully and, that helps. You know, <laughs> Bill, and I'll, I'll, I'll add layers to what you're saying there too. As you progress in your futures uh, in industry or wherever, and you become a manager, a manager of managers and on up, you know, I think it's important as well that if there are mistakes made and it's in your organization, you, you participate in that ownership. And I'll share with you guys, as you know, I now currently, and for the last many years, I've been working in the customer service end of our utilities. And Lord knows we've made mistakes on bills. We've made mistakes with service delivery, et cetera. And, and I'll call customers myself, even if it was a crew that made an error, I'll, I'll make that call to that customer. Because as Bill said, it's, it's how you um, follow through on, on what happened and, and join in that ownership as well. And I always appreciate if that employee that potentially did make an error or a mistake Let's me know too, and then I'll help that person out throughout because they stepped up, owned what they did, and we'll make it right for that customer. And you will have customers in your future someday. Uh, really, no matter what role you're in, you, you're, you're going to give service in whatever aspect of the world you work in. You're going to be providing some sort of a service or a delivery to people. So participate as well with those who work for you. And again, and, and it goes to building that team. Yeah, and, and a word of caution, particularly for women. Um, what, what I'm hearing from Louise and Bill is about ownership and leadership and accountability. But the caution for women is don't, I'm trying to think of the right word. So help me if you, know, if you can, but it, it's like, oh, I'm sorry, I screwed up. May not be the right words. It's an accountability and leadership of, I see that this is wrong. I'm going to own it. And here's how I'm going to fix it instead of a denigrating view that not any gators would do, but you might see <laughs> women in the workplace because it's unfortunately a characteristic of the Western world. So there's a difference between owning, correcting, leading, and being accountable and being stepped on and being the mat of some mistake. Does that make sense? Yeah, that's a very good point, Carol. It, it, how you say it is important. They don't still want still be the leader. Yeah, it's they still want you to own it. You can't let go of it or feel like you're a you can't a mistake is not you're a mistake. A mistake was made, but you're not a mistake. An error is made, but you're not an error. You still have value. You have to know where your value comes from. And it and that's why self-awareness is so important. Because just because you make a mistake doesn't mean you're a mistake. Just because you failed on something doesn't mean you're a failure. And that's so easy to use those words and those words can be so self-condemning. I mean, Carol's point, I think is extraordinary. I mean, that, that's, you just gotta be very careful to maintain the ownership and just, it's a thing you're gonna go fix. It's not you as a failure. Because Carol, it's that self-talk that women have in our heads, right? More so than men. That's say, ooh, you failed. You're an error. I like how you said that, Bill. Say, yeah, there's an error, but you're not an error. <laughs> yeah, I, I think that's incredibly important. And that was sort of the, the second question I had teed up for the panel 
um, was, you know, I, I assume that this very um, confident leadership driven mechanism of owning mistakes and, you know, calling customers to apologize. I'm guessing that this wasn't a skill set uh, that you magically had the second you walked out of college. I'm guessing that this took a while to develop and practice and this self-talk and being able to operationalize mistakes um, independently of your identity. Uh, I think this is, I suspect, a practiced skill. Um, do you have some uh, maybe anecdotes about when, uh, from an earlier time, when it wasn't <laughs> such a practice skill and how you worked on improving it, or maybe some techniques you've coached uh, some of your other, you know, mentees or people on your teams about how to practice this skill and build on it? Well, nobody's talking, so I'll go. <laughs> yeah, sorry. Um, one of the things I, I have done early on is I tried to figure out what, what, what values am I going to live by? What are the values that I hold dear that I am going to hold? And I, I called it the pact. I made a pact with myself. It's a acrostic, but P is passion and mission. I'm going to be passionate about what I do and passionate about the mission that I serve. And Luis mentioned that, but that's really, if you're not passionate about it, don't, don't bother doing it. I mean, it's second one is I'm going to be, always be accountable. And so that's the A of PACT. And the third one is I, I'm always going to be collaborative. I'm going to be a collaborative person. And no matter if that other person wants to be or not, Luis mentioned finance. It doesn't matter if they're not in the engineering function. I'm going to be collaborative. And the last one is I'm going to be transparent, or in my case, authentic and transparent. So I'm always going to do that. And I'm always going to have that as my core values. And so when I judge my behaviors, I'm always, I go back to that. One of the harshest feedback I got early on um, was a 45 minute lecture by a leader in the company. And they basically ripped me from head to toe. And I, thankfully, with God's grace, I did not remember everything the person said because as I left I thought I'm not that person so the first thing for me was I'm not that person I'm not that is not who I am and that's where I got this whole thing about I'm not a failure I may have failed at something but I am not a failure and I tried to take what is actionable about what they said let me move these feelings I feel so horrible about and move it into what can I do that's actionable I'm not going to take on 50 things I'm going to take on one or two things that I can do. And then I had to assess, is this real or is this just their issue? Because sometimes it's their issue. They had a torque day. I actually thought I was going to be fired the next day after this 45 minute lecture because this person was way up in the company. And I asked people, is this guy going to fire me tomorrow? Is he going to fire me? And they said, no, he's probably forgotten about it by now. This is his issue. Well, it didn't feel good. I mean, it, that wasn't what I was expecting. And the last thing is, is this consistent with who I am? There are certain things I can't, I just can't change. I mean, I, I am what I am. I, I can't be what I can't be somebody else. I can be the best me I can be, but I can't be somebody else. And so to walk through that, for me, it started with my values and then it became, I got to figure out if this feedback is real and whether I want to internalize it. I have to build up some mechanism internally to process it. Because um, people, people say crazy things. You know, it's the sticks and stones when you're a kid. It's you know, the words can really hurt, and it you have to figure out how you're going to process it. And I, I know we all process it differently, but for me, it really went down to those three steps. Can I take anything actionable away from this? Is it my issue or theirs? And do I want to? And then I would set a little action plan and say, okay, I'm going to go deal with it. So. Not sure if I answered it as well as you wanted, but that's my that's my input. No, that's no I hope there's not yellers in the world as much as there were maybe in the days when we first became. They're not uh, yelling. Do, do maybe yell. Don't be the work. boss that's the yeller. <laughs> it's, it, it wasn't so much yelling, but it's so forceful. No, yeah. Such a. With harsh I did, words. I did and, not speak for 45 minutes. I literally sat there and this person lectured me about why I was useless. Yeah. Now later, the person said, oh, Bill's a really great person. I'm like, well, what, what in the world? I mean, how could you do that? This person also, who was my mother, would call me on the phone. And I'd hold the phone away from my ear because they're just like lecturing. 
I, you have to figure out what you internalize and, and what you want to change. You you can control yourself. You you have you're so valuable as a human being. You can't let other people own your mind and own and what you, who you are. Lot, because it builds on something we were talking or some notes I think that you had, Dr. Simmons, about. Have you ever had those bad days where you just walked out, you know, full of emotion? And I think, Bill, your response, you know, so measured and so analytical. And I think I'm more on the side of, I didn't have a measured plan like you did when things went wrong. Um, And I will spare you the, the very hard upbringing that I had, but being there at the University of Florida was my only option. Um, to come from where I came to get a degree was not something my family or siblings um, was within reach. And so for me, there, that, that was my only option. Um, it, it was that or, and you can fill in the blanks, you know, you, you live on the streets or you, you know, starve or whatever those words you want to fill in. Um, and not to take away from what we're seeing in the world where people are doing that all the time. But for me, that was it. It was no option. I, and that's the only thing that came back to me. It's this or abject poverty, living in my, I didn't have a car. <laughs> um, so it, it's how you take it. And those most emotional moments where I did internalize those things, it was to take a walk, take a breath and remind myself, this is it and it's up to me to go back and build the story you said is the way you handled it was for you. This boss had gone on to something else. No one's as harsh on you as you are. So it's up to you to take that moment, catch your breath and go right back after your dream. Don't ever give it away. Carol, that was good. I, I was lucky to, to learn some lessons and, and, and I guess, internalize them early. And to this day, I can remember my father, um, as I was growing up, he's an attorney. So I always felt like I lived on the witness stand. Um, But he he taught me a great lesson by just a phrase that he would look at me and say, Louise, are you listening or reloading? And that helped, that's why I gave you the point about listening, two ears, one mouth. You've got to truly, and and listening is a full contact sport. You really need to be sure you're listening. That was a lesson I learned because early in my career, mistakes I made was to react too quickly. And the words came out before I thought or truly listened. And, And that can be, that it was problematic initially. And good feedback from good leaders that I had who, thank goodness, took an interest in me or like Carol, you said, or Bill said, you you said earlier, you're hired as an investment for a company. So they will invest in you and you've got to deliver. So luckily someone wanted to continue the investment in me and did and shared good, just listening and leadership skills. I'll just have a funny anecdote too. When I was in high school and I worked summers and I worked in a manufacturing plant that manufactured um, pasteurization and homogenization equipment for the dairy industry. And I was in their drafting department and I drafted out a drawing for a back plate for one of these big instrument panels. And the union Uh, line crew taught me a lesson when they brought the first panel that came off the line from my drawing and I drew it backwards. So all the holes that were supposed to be here were flipped over and over here and they brought that to me and they actually, they caught it with just one plate being produced and they engraved on it. You know, Louise Scott, future engineer. um, (laughs) Just as a and then it on the bottom said something like, check your work. <laughs> it's like, oh, okay. <laughs> and I was grateful for the way that they handled that. I, I probably could have been fired easily. I could have wasted a whole lot of uh, the company's money in terms of materials and time with those crews. But when stuff like that happens, take note and learn. 
uh, from those kinds of mistakes. Luckily, two examples I had, they, they, they weren't devastating to me or my career and I grew from what I learned in those examples. I guess one of the things I, I bet all three of us have is we found people who we could give us real feedback that still cared about us. Yeah. And it wasn't necessarily our boss, but people who we could trust to say, what do you think I could do better? How, how did I handle that? In a way that we knew that even when that conversation was over, they still cared for us, they still loved us, whatever the term you want to use, but they still were important to us. And those people are career builders for you. You have to have a network like that. It, you can't go it alone. You're going to have moments. Yeah. And, so all and, of us have to have those people. And one thing, I'll, one thing I'll add is especially that I think is especially important for students is parents aren't always the best source of that. Um, sometimes their progression through similar careers is 20 or 30 years offset. So their advice, you know, just might not really be spot on anymore. Um, maybe they didn't go through your same uh, career trajectory. Um, and, and I know with my parents, they still think I do the same things I did when I was 15, right? Like they'll still give me advice and it just sounds like they're talking to a 15 year old version of me. I can just tell, you know? And so, and so I think, yes, parents are valuable um, consultants often, but I think that's one of the reasons this program talks so much about mentoring is that it's really important to find lots of different people who you trust uh, to give you this kind of honest feedback. Some who are closer to your age, some who are closer to your industry, some who um, are not in your industry at all. So they can give you more generic input about um, you know, life and careers generally to, to compare and contrast with the information you're getting from your specific industry. Um, so, so I just wanted to add that tidbit because I think that that's, um, you know, something important to consider when you're building your mentoring network. Um, and so I don't know if the other panelists <laughs> have things to add um, on that. Sometimes, let me add one thing. Is yeah. it, Sometimes that's called your personal board of directors. It, it, there, that's a term like that people it. use. Okay. It's got a, and you want people of different age groups. The last thing I would tell you is, look, if you've got friends and you're in college and you're whatever that you're hanging out with, Ask them for the three words that people use to describe you. And don't argue with them, but just ask them. And ask maybe two or three people, what are the three words people use to describe you? And see if you find a pattern, because you'll find your strengths that way. People, other, other people see you differently. And you may hear things that you go, I'm not that, I mean, I'm not, they're giving me the benefit of the doubt. They may see things in you, I don't know if it was Carol, at least said, they may see, name is Louise, they may see things in you you don't see today but it's really powerful. And you need to do that like once a year, at least, if not more often, what, what are the people who say, how do people describe me? And you'll be amazed at how to help you. I like that, Bill, and I, I wanna build on it in the sense of as students, you're so overwhelmed with coursework and tests. And like I said, maybe some of you are working, but there's power in your peers even now. And, and right now, maybe peers look like competitors for grades, if, if you transition that from competitiveness to the power of working together, my freshman year there, I was the only woman <laughs> in a lot of my classes. Um, far, farther up in junior, senior year, was the only woman um, in all of the classes. And um, I had a peer uh, as my freshman year that Maybe he thought about those three words, Bill, and saw something in me I didn't see and asked me to be an officer for the American Society of Mechanical Engineers student section. And I will give a shout out right now to Mitch Waldman because he saw that, he invited me and I progressed through that um, to be president of that ASME section. And it says two things about the power of the peers and it's also about um, the power of men in the workforce. It is transitioning now and depending on me mechanical and aerospace is, is uh, predominantly men still, you may see better balance in things like chemical or um, electrical or environmental, sure. But there is power in men as mentors. They don't understand everything. So you've got your personal board of directors there 
But don't misunderstand that those are decision makers. They can help you if they are the right fit for you. So don't shy away from a man's input as part of what you consider, not all. That's awesome. Thank you, Carol. Uh, and with our, so we're, we're rapidly um, wrapping up our 50 minute session here. Um, time is really flying. Uh, are, and do any of this uh, students on the call, or I think we also have a couple faculty logged in. Are there other questions for the panel um, from the call? I do, I do. I have Scott. I do have your questions. Um, we'll give we'll give people ten more seconds to unmute, and then I will uh, <laughs> carry on. By the right. way, the introverts won't unmute, but. I put my email up in my left hand, up my corner up there, wgattle one at gmail.com. If you have any questions, I'll forward it on to all three speakers today. You send it to me, I'll give it to all three of us. Because I know if I was sitting in your audience, I would never unmute. Okay. <laughs> I, would, I would die before I'd unmute. Thank you. So we, we have the, uh, the, the introvert giving us uh, one very important skill, <laughs> allowing people for offline asynchronous follow up. Thank you. Um, all right. And in these last couple of minutes, um, Dr. Banks put forward a, a helpful question. Um, he noted that in the old days, uh, it's expected that you would spend most of your career at a single company. And actually all of the panelists have articulated, you know, when a company hires you, they're making an investment in you. Um, now it seems like that the, the ROI might have to be realized in six to 36 months rather than, you know, 10, 20, 30 years. Uh, so, so what's your uh, advice on sort of balancing personal trajectories and ambitions with loyalty and persistence uh, in a company? You know, how, how do you think about those competing interests? So I'm jumping on this one because both Bill and Louise, you're much more loyal than I am. And it, it, was, it was not about loyalty for me. Um, it was about, okay, I, I want to encourage all of you to take what you've learned today about knowing yourself, establishing your values, understanding what's important to you, and tempering that with some patience. Um, I right now work for a startup that I've worked for all of four months and I am jumping, I can't even say it without laughing. I'm moving from this wonderful, incredible startup, I've never been so happy with my job, into a stable, large company because it's what I need for myself. I need that stability as I look at the world around me and I look at uh, uh, longevity of paychecks and insurance and whatever is important to me in the latter days of my career. Um, know yourself, know your values, keep your network strong. And I guess what I want to say is you're not really letting anyone down if you decide to move on. The company I'm going back to, Lockheed Martin, was a company I worked for 25 years ago. So it is fascinating how these things come back around. So don't burn any bridges either because somebody that may have been a co-worker is now the vice president of everything. So you've gotta be aware of some of those things. I, I, I'm not sure I'm giving you those solid gems that you're jotting down in your notes at this moment. Um, I think that the world has changed. I think that we need to change with it. And you give you, leave the place better than when you found it give your everything to the very last day, but you do need to manage your own career. Maybe someone will help you and maybe they won't, but it is, it's up to you. Nothing's fatal. It's, it's all going to be okay. <laughs> I'm talking to myself now. <laughs> yeah, no, I, I, I think we can all appreciate that. Uh, and that to, sounds like excellent advice to me. Uh, and so, uh, and Unless uh, Louise or Bill have anything to top that, I think we're probably right about that time. Actually, actually I was gonna, I, I'm sorry for keep doing this. But anyway, there's three things that I think play into this decision. Uh, the first one is your work-life balance. Do you, are you willing to move? I wasn't able to move. I, I, you know, I had five kids. So it was like, I needed the state stability of the work where I was at. So that's number one is you have to assess where you are in your life. Do you wanna move? Do you wanna start 
a knit fresh, or you have to reprove yourself potentially. All those things are going to weigh bandit. The second one is, is how much risk do you want to take in your career? I say that because it's actually a fallacy to say that. When you say there's risk in your career, what you're saying is, I need this job. You won't get freedom until you realize, I don't really need this job. I, can, I, can, I am confident enough that I can find a place to work anywhere. But if you live under the sphere of it's too risky to change, that's probably not a great thing. You, you need to get to the place because then you are, probably aren't taking risk inside the company either. You have to be confident enough in yourself to be able to move around. The third thing is the reason why most people quit jobs or leave their jobs is they aren't quitting the company, they're quitting their boss. Their boss is either not taking care of them, they're not moving in the head, their career is stagnated. They don't, in those cases, you got to move. If you're not reinvigorating yourself, in my opinion, every two to three years, it doesn't mean you need a new job. But if you aren't getting a new challenge every two or three years and you're stagnated, you need to do something, even if it's technical, learn something new. You need to be reinvigorating yourself all the time. Challenge yourself like a freshman. Every, you know, when you get to be a senior, you know everything, you go back and do it again. And that, that's what you need. So those are the three reasons why I think. And plus this, the market is so dang hot right now. If you want a bunch of money, just get out there and float your resume and you'll probably get a bunch of money. So that's, that's, uh, that is not the official view of L3 Harris. But anyway, that's right now the market. You can get a big raise by moving around. All right, I'll let somebody else go. No, I think they said beautiful comments um, to, to wrap things up. And I, I, Chelsea, I appreciate you bringing that up about the difference now of, you know, 30 year careers in one place versus elsewhere. And who knows where that's, that might become a trend again, who knows? But, you know, as the great Maya Angelou says, people don't remember what you do, but how you, you made them feel that's true for when you leave a job. So it's important how you treat people and what you're known for. Awesome. All right, well, with that, I think that is a great place to leave this discussion. Um, as you heard, Bill is welcoming your emails and we'll forward those to the rest of the panelists. I also welcome your emails, um, css at ufl.edu. If you have questions you'd like me to pass along or suggestions for follow-up. Um, and with that, let's thank the speakers. All right, and go Gators. Everybody have a great afternoon. Thank you. Very insightful. Thanks, everyone.